All right. There is the practice. It is also turned on on Poll Everywhere, so go ahead and take a minute. I would like for you to use this code, hash code, in order to insert these key value pairs. Keep in mind here that what we've got is we've got strings as keys and we've got numbers as values. So you have to apply this hash code that is literally, as you can see here, looking at string input dot length. Use that to generate the hash number that's then modded by the array size and find where each of these things goes in appropriately. And then as you can see here, we are using separate chaining as our clash collision resolution strategy. Yes. Ooh, oh, you mean in the, like in the separate chains? Yes. Ooh, let's say you're going to append to the back of the list with the separate chains. Good clarification. Okay, while you do that, I'm gonna try and set this cursor without, maybe if I do it with the mouse first. Oh, okay, let's see what happens. Ooh. Nope, it froze the moment I touched it. It happened, okay. <laughs> At least the bug's very reproducible. All right, I'm now going to have to do my delightful task flow where I have to uh, restart PowerPoint because why not? Why not? So just give me a second here. Keep looking at things. I know it's gonna go away for a hot second. I'm sorry. So we're gonna do this one. Okay, will you let me mark up the screen now? Let's see. Okay, please. Highlighter. Aha, okay. And I will add the Okay. All right. Uh, let's go through bit by bit. So the first entry, the key is the string of the single character A. Can anybody raise their hand and tell me which bucket that hashes to? I love it. One. All right. Mm. Oh, okay. Cool. Somewhat animations. Okay. Uh, how about the second one? A, B. Two. Cool. I agree. Two. One. What about the letter C? One. Aha. Yes. Because remember, we're doing the length of things. But can we put C into the bucket one? Ooh. Yes, thank you. Yes. So, yes, everyone's good moment of intuition there. It was like, oh, where we want to put it? There's already somebody living in that house. Uh, I don't know, three little pigs somehow. <laughs> um, but what we're going to do is when we have C, this is, remember, something we call a collision. And that collision is here at the bucket one, and because we're using separate chaining to resolve our collisions, what that means is, is that for any time we have more than one thing that's hashing to the same bucket, we just append onto the linked list. So each of these buckets, like really this is null right now, null, null, you know what I mean? These are all null linked lists. 
And as we add something, that becomes the first node in that linked list. And then as we hit collisions, we add other things onto the linked list. So now, how about this one, ABC? What bucket does that belong in? Three, I agree. What about ABCD? What bucket does that belong in? Four, yes, because it's got one, two, three, four. That's the length that would be returned. So we're putting it into bucket four. Okay, what about this one? Eight. Ah, okay. This is hilarious, actually. I think this one's actually an error because this has a length of eight, right? And this got put into here, but this actually, ignore that. That goes here. Yeah. Okay, then uh, the one that I believe the poll everywhere is about, five. Which bucket does that get hashed to? Four. So that one also will just sort of, will like, boop, 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 add on there. And then what about this one, hello, space world? One. Let's see, because there's... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So yes, I agree. That goes into the bucket one. This is me Santa checking past Casey. Um, so let, this one's an error. Um, so that's what the final state of this would look like. Does anybody have any questions on how this function works to put these items into this hash table with separate chaining? Cool. Question? Yeah. Oh, the poll everywhere says linear probing. Okay, sorry, I tried to change it really quickly. Ignore that. We are going to learn what linear probing is in a few minutes. But thank you. It's my bad for trying to change things as we go. Cool, okay. Um, so announcements, reminder that exercise two is out. Um, the TAs are going to get started on grading exercise one. Unfortunately, they're not going to be able to turn it around in the time uh, before this exercise two, but then from all exercises on, you'll have feedback on it. Uh, we are grading the exercises for correctness, FYI, but we're not grading like we would necessarily grade a midterm or something like that. Uh, project two, of course, is due not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. But gosh darn, if this isn't a fabulous week to go to office hours. Yeah, woo, yeah. Anybody here already been to office hours for project two? Anybody? This is me giving you brownie points. Heck yes. Okay, see, look at how empty office hours is. You see how few hands went up? The TAs are so sad and so lonely and they're gonna be so stressed next week. So now is a great time to get lovely help from those TAs. Does anybody have any other administrative questions for the day? Cool. I thought it'd also be fun. Like I said, I sort of threw that poll everywhere together at the end of last week while also I was struggling with technical stuff. Let's see. Let's see what our word cloud spat out. How are you feeling about this class so far? I agree, muffin. <laughs> really captures the sentiment. Uh, there you go, 290. Oh, nice. Look at this. Heck yes. There you go. All right. Slightly. I'm not sure what now means. Am I too old to understand that one? Is that like a meh? Is that what that means? Nobody. What is, does does N A U R have it? Yeah. Please. No in Australia. Oh, sure. No, 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 mate. That was terrible. That didn't sound Australian at all. If you're from that area of the world, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, there we go. Look at <laughs> cool. Wow, we moving mischievous. I appreciate it. Do I want to know what the non English characters one means? What does it mean? Lots of Chinese, that's what it means? Okay, actually, I'm very here for that. Shout out to everybody putting that one in. <laughs> very about that. Heck yes. <laughs> um, amazing. Okay, all right. There's officially definitely not 333 people in this class. So, um, all right, what a joy. But here you go. You can see we're all somewhere along the lines of crying versus muffin. So, you know, pretty standard feelings. All right. Okay. Um, okay, then uh, if nobody has any other administrative questions, we're going to finish up our round of hashing today. 
So technically, the end of last uh, lecture gave you all of the things you needed for the programming assignment, except let's be real, I needed things to be said to me more than once to fully understand them. So I'm going to go over those things really briefly here. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, the question that I didn't erase from the uh, poll everywhere, what this thing called linear probing is, and some of the other different designs behind hashing. Uh, but if you can't tell, we're trying to go really deep on one particular implementation of hashing, in particular the one that we think is the most likely to get used in industry or in interviews, so that's why we're having you do project two. Uh, so you have that real hashing, like from the ground up experience. Um, so things to keep in mind when you are implementing your hash tables as part of project two. Uh, so remember we talked about this concept of lambda, lambda being that resize or that load factor. So lambda equals n, i.e. how many things are currently stored in your array over c, the capacity of how many things could be stored in your array. And in separate chaining, because we can kind of overstuff each bucket, we might actually, if we don't stop and resize, get to a lambda of over one. And that's bad, because that means there's got to be collisions, right? If we have more things than there are buckets, we know there's collisions. So we're trying to reduce collisions. So remember that whenever lambda hits one, trigger a resize in the size of your underlying array, which would mean that like whatever your capacity is, you're going to do two times that capacity next prime. And then that'll sort of like stretch out the ends. And I'm going to talk about that in more detail because item two, as you can see, is when you do hit that moment of resize, choose a table length that will help reduce collisions. Because remember that uh, every time we generate that hash code, we then mod it by the table size to fit it into how many buckets we actually have. So if we have a table size of, say, two, we're going to have a lot of collisions. If we have a table size of 10, we might have lots of collisions. But if instead we multiply the array length by two and then choose the nearest prime number, every time we do that hash code mod by table size, we're less likely to get collisions because there's fewer common divisors with prime numbers. That's sort of like part of the definition of prime numbers. So here, for example, is literally just the list of the first prime numbers because yeah, Casey had to look it up this morning because I don't know them off the top of my head. And then to give you a sense, it's like maybe instead of starting your table at 10, you started to say 11, which is a prime number pretty close to where we generally start. And then at the moment we try to resize, we would say 11 times two, which would technically be 22. But if we kind of like increase it to the next closest prime number, which is 23, we're going to kind of reduce collisions down. And then the next time we're ready to resize, we multiply 23 by 2, which would be 46. And then like, hey, guess what? 47 is really close. That's a better choice for the underlying size of our array, and so on and so forth. Does anyone have any questions about that? Uh, a bunch of people asked me good clarifying questions at the end of lecture yesterday, or Monday, yeah. The, you'll find that like when people implement this resize, so like, let's see. No, nope. why would you do that to me, computer? Work with me, baby. Okay, uh, so what you will probably see is like the resize function, right? It probably comes in and it's like int double equals, you know, current capacity times two. And then you probably get like int next prime and then you say pass in that whatever double number is and then it would spit back out the next one up kind of thing and so then you get like int new capacity you know kind of thing so that's just how it's implemented um so generally we're always going to round up yes other questions on this piece of it okay and then we spent a good amount of time on Friday, because I know days of the week, uh, talking about this idea of the hash code. So I've been kind of commingling this, but keep in mind that there is a little bit of a distinction here. So for every key, whether it is itself an int or totally not an int, whatever that key item is, we have to generate some type of int value 
that we're going to call the hash code. And then once we have the hash code, then we mod by table size. So this hash code is sort of tied to that particular key value object. It's deterministic in that, you know, we did a situation where say it's just however long that string is, the string dot length, or we did a situation where it's the summation of casting each letter to its ASCII number, something like that. Those are unique ASCII or those are unique int hash codes that are associated with each type of key, but we're always going to have to mod it by table size so that it can fit in the actual size of the capacity that we have. And since we're resizing, we might need to recompute those hash codes over and over again. We're just going to generate a different bucket for it based on the underlying size of the hash table. And so when we're generating those hash codes, the things that we're trying to balance, balance is we're trying to balance the runtime of computing the hash code and eliminating collisions. So for every collision, we know we incur a little bit of runtime that moves us away from that ideal constant time sort of in out of hash tables. Like if we accidentally remember that degenerate hash table where the worst case scenario is everything hashes to the same bucket, that's obviously a pretty suboptimal runtime. So collisions always incur some runtime, but we have to recognize that we're doing some computations in order to get out those hash code numbers, and we don't want to spend so much computation just getting the number that we lose all the goodness of trying to reduce collisions. So we're always trying to play this sort of balancing act between these two. So these are our three big uh, best practices. Does anyone have any questions on these pieces so far? Here are some more slides to support you in working through project two. So remember that if we resize, like in this situation, we originally had a array with a capacity of five, and we can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight items in here. So when we hit eight over five, that was definitely greater than one. That you know definitely needed a resize moment. But if all we do is expand and then just copy things over into the new array, we might end up with a situation like this, where like this top part of the array looks really dense, and this bottom part of the array uh, is really sparse. That didn't help us with our collisions. And also, it's not easy for us to find where things are now because we're always going to generate the hash code, modify table size, and that's our deterministic bucket. So remember that when you trigger a resize, there's a few different pieces to it, right? So there's sort of like, you know, like add entry. Once you do that, like check lambda if lambda is like greater than or equal to one then what we do right is we like make new array that's c times two to the next prime number right and then after we do that we sort of have to fill up the array new array but in order to do that, what that means is we're going to have to loop over the old array and get the hash code for each item and then mod it by table size. So here, one belonged in bucket one of a capacity of five. Maybe it ends up in bucket one of a capacity of 10. But here, for example, six, we can guess the hash code there was probably just using the keys themselves. So like six mod five that put it in bucket one but six mod ten can now fill up bucket six so this entry finds a new bucket in the new capacity array and it's really important that we go back over every single entry and recompute its bucket for the new array recompute bucket Doo -doo -doo. there we go so that it ends up sort of like nice and distributed. So you can see now like what we took was like the sort of like dense array. We resized it. And now look, like we've distinctly eliminated uh, a number of the collisions. Maybe there's still some collisions left over. But we've spread ourselves out quite a bit more. Any questions on that piece of it? Yeah. 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 Do you have a question? Sorry.
Ooh, good question. So what is the runtime of this resize? So um, we know that we're going to have to touch every single thing, right? Every single, single thing is going to have to get moved from one side to the other. So we know it's at least N. But for each thing that we touch, what we're going to do is we're going to call its hash code. And then we're going to mod that pi table size. So it's not going to be N squared as long as the computation to generate the hash code isn't N. For example, like it's going to be whatever like n times the computation is, which hopefully you've picked some constant time thing that's like, you know, dot length or sum up the letters or something like that, which the summing up the letters might be funny because keep in mind if we have like strings as our keys, the value n is the count of strings and generating the hash codes might need to touch every letter in the string. But the number of letters across the string is like a different value than the number of strings. So n will count for the number of keys and then some computation to get the hash code. Yeah. Any other questions on the resize? Yeah. Oh, huh, it would be incidentally then, yeah. So for example, if we, or would it be? No, I guess not technically. Um, it would be incidentally n squared if we were doing a hash code computation that say was based on the number of letters in a string and each string had n letters or something like that, that would be n squared. Um, or let's say each string had m letters, just some other variable, that it would be nm would be the runtime. Um, but the capacity of the array technically doesn't matter. It matters how many values are currently stored in there because that movement of resizing, we're just going to go item by item. We're going to loop over. We're going to be like, okay, this one, one, rehash, where does it belong? There. This one, rehash, where does it belong? There. This one, rehash, where does that belong? Blow up there. So we're just going to go over the values of n and the resize. These are more things about resizing. Um, yeah, so this is just a, hey, for project two, I will tell you, you might be like, Casey, why do you have three slides on this? Why did we just spend five minutes talking about this? Because gosh darn, if this isn't the thing you're gonna forget to do, don't worry, we've all seen it. But if you are like, things aren't working the way that you should, and you look at your hash table and it's all weird and clumpy like this, Ask yourself, did you remember to rehash things after you resized? Every time you change the C, every time you change the internal capacity, you change the availability of buckets, and so you have to rehash. Cool. There's some more things you can read. Um, these are some notes about how hash codes work in Java, which can be a little weird. I think I vaguely mentioned to y'all the object class. So like object, is technically at the top of everything, like array inherits from object kind of thing, you know, and then like so on and so forth. And so this is just a definition of the Java class. And so object includes specifically an equals method and a an hash code method. And really it exists in that way because it wants you to override those methods if you are trying to create a uh, object that functions appropriately. So you have to override both hash code and equals for any object that your hash table is going to use. And keep in mind that the hash code function has to be deterministic. So for example, if a dot equals b is true, then the hash code for a has to be the hash code for b. This is really just saying the hash codes have to be deterministic in the same way that equals um, evaluates them. So for example, equals in a string will go through letter by letter and check that each character is exactly the same. So for example, like, you know, if A was a string of all lowercase capitals and B was a string of the same letters, but uppercase capital, they wouldn't pass the equals test, right? Capitalization matters in equals. Well, then if that's the case, capitalization should matter in the hash code as well. So really it's just this piece here, just whenever you're overriding those hash codes, make sure that two objects that would be determined true if you call equals on them, that their hash codes must also match. Otherwise you'll get some weird errors. 
And when I say the term deterministic, what that just means is that I should be able to put the same object in and get the same hash code out each time. For example, you don't want to have a hash code function that like picks a random number. That would be a different thing each time kind of situation. Or um, I think I had a hash code, right, that was like, here's, a, here's something deterministic. And then also just spontaneously add in the next like random prime number. That's not a good one either. So make sure that whatever object gets put into the hash code that you get that same hash code back out based on its values. Cool, and we pretty much talked about it. There we go, there's some more sort of summations of good hashing that we sort of talked about. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, this pretty much wraps up our conversation around the one type of collision resolution we learned so far, which is separate chaining, which is the time type we're asking you to implement. But I mentioned there's a bunch of other ways to handle these collisions. So solution, the big other category of solution here is something we call open addressing. So open addressing, this instead resolves collisions instead of just like overloading the bucket by creating buckets that are just linked lists that can hold as many things as you want. You instead just choose a different location if the natural choice is already full. So Linear probing, which is a subset of open addressing, if there's a collision, just keep looking to the neighbor to the right until we find an open spot. So instead of just like creating a chain, we'll say, hey, if this bucket is full, look next door. If that's empty, that's where I'm going to live. So here is how the code would work. Here's some pseudocode. So you can see here, when we're trying to find where a key's going to hash to its bucket, we get out its natural hash. So we call get hash, whatever that tells us it's going to belong. And then we, you know, mod by the table size while we do. And then we say while index is in use. So if that space is empty, great. You're the first one there. You get your what we would call natural hash. That's the bucket that you would hash to based on your hash code and modding by table size. But if that's busy, then we just sort of like look next door <laughs> and we check that. Let's look at it in an actual, let's see if the animations work. Um, okay, so we're trying to hash these int values. We're just using the int values as their own hash code. So one is gonna hash to the bucket one because this is a table size of 10. Cool, there was nothing there, no problem. Now we're gonna try and hash five. Five mod table size of 10 is five. So that sits there. Now we're gonna try and hash 11. 11 mod table size is one, but like, oh no, it's full. So we recognize that it's next door neighbor is empty. So 11 then comes to rest one to the right of its natural hash. We can do seven. Now, for example, we come in and we're ready to hash 12. Where is 12's natural hash? Two, I agree. I love all the fingers too. Two. But can it rest in two? No. Where do we think it's going to end up? I agree. So even though like somebody else is there, it's not in their natural hash, I'm still going to try and then I realize, nope, I got to go one next door. What about 17? Where do we think it's going to end up? Eight, I agree, it's natural hash of seven, but eight is empty. Okay, six can go right in there. So now, taking a look at the current state of this, where do we think the final resting place of 25 is going to be? Yep, absolutely, can't go there. So this is now how this has been implemented using linear probing. Linear probing because I just check one next door. Yes. How would you think you'd find the wall to your three? So then, if this is how I put things in, how do I find the thing I'm looking for? Does anyone want to take a guess as to how we do it? Yeah. Would you like check the spot if it's not there just keep looking for it and repeat that? Exactly. You check its natural hash. And if it's not the thing you're looking for, then you just look next door because it should theoretically be around there. So similar 
to that extra runtime we occurred in the linear or in the separate chaining where we go to the bucket and then if there's a big string off of that we have to loop through possibly or loop off of that linked list and that loop might run however many times there are collisions we kind of have a similar situation here where we're going to start by looking at that uh natural hash location and then we're going to loop through what we are going to call the cluster until we either find the thing or we hit an empty square where am i now yes so then uh since we're talking about it what would we say is the worst case scenario runtime of finding something or attempting to find something that is not in our collection? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Exactly. And so if we have a worst case scenario, that's a situation where everything has hashed to the same bucket. We have a hundred percent collision rate, which means we have N collisions, which means in order to find my thing, I might have to loop N times to get all the way through those things until I realize, Hey, guess what? Like it's not in this set. So exactly like separate chaining where our worst case scenario could be linear. We could have a linear situation with probing, but like I sort of mentioned before, that's like the worst case. So just keep that in the back of your mind. We're trying to avoid that situation. What's the absolute best case? How many collisions would we have in our best case scenario? No collisions. So what's the runtime of getting something out if we have no collisions? Constant, yeah, I love it, the ones. Yeah, exactly. So if I have no collisions, I get constant time lookup, constant time placement, exactly the same as separate chaining. Yes? Ooh, interesting question. In fact, I think a perfect segue. Uh, let's see what happens here. Okay, so we try to put 38, 38 mo is our hash code. We mod it by table size. We get out eight, it goes into bucket eight. Then we try to put nine in here. And then I think this is sort of where your question's going. We try to put eight, but like we can't get anything to the right. So boom, we're gonna wrap it around. That's how we handle that situation. Uh, so in this case then, 109 is next. What bucket do we think 109 will come to rest in? One, I agree. Ooh, okay, it did it, kind of. <laughs> uh, and then again, where do we think 10 will come to rest? Two. Two. I agree. So here what we've got now is, as you can imagine, even though all of these things didn't collide to the same exact bucket, 10 kind of suffered the runtime, like, problems that were generated by inserting 8 and 109, right? This is what we call a cluster. <laughs> Make your own jokes about it. Uh, so this is actually specifically something we call primary clustering. It can be caused by linear probing. And it's when we cause these long chains of occupied slots within the hash table where you sort of have like, this is open, but this is, you know, full. So things are kind of like collected together. And so then anything that has to get inserted or retrieved from in the middle of that cluster is going to hit that bad runtime. And that bad runtime of those collisions, even though not everything might be colliding to the same bucket, they all kind of compound together when we're trying to do that retrieval. As opposed to separate chaining, where you really only had to suffer the runtime incurred by the collisions on the same bucket, because like the buckets didn't impact each other. Linear probing has that kind of little weirdness, right? Where, uh, you know, clusters here might impact the runtime of a natural hash next door. So clustering causes more looping. Um, 
So uh, just this is our sort of like runtime analysis and ref uh, reviewing linear probing. So when is the runtime good? When we hit an empty slot or the empty slot is close by. When is runtime bad? Whenever we hit one of these clusters, which is anytime we have a collision or anytime we hit a cluster, which could be caused by a series of collisions all within sort of the same general area. So the maximum load factor, like literally the physical maximum load factor here is at most one because this ha array cannot store more than a singular thing at each bucket. Each bucket is maybe of type pair, you know? But in order to prevent that type of cluster problem, the rule of thumb for a linear probing hash table is to resize when lambda is one half. So you will find that in a convention, the linear probing resolution to collisions is we are going to keep a lot more empty space available in our hash table. We're going to resize a little bit more regularly in our hash table. Yes. Why an empty slot makes the runtime good? So if there is an empty slot, um, this specific, like here, this is like I'm trying to hash something and it's natural hashes available. I.e., we, we didn't have a collision is really what this means. Yeah, no collision. So you can start to see why collisions are a particular obsession with hashing because pretty much hashing is magical rainbows and puppy dogs except for this collision problem and then that's when things start to go bad oh but casey these clusters that's so silly and then we have all this empty space and we have probably like we saw in that last one where it seems like we have like everything sort of clustered together and a bunch of empty space what if instead of just looking next door we tried to distribute our things a little bit better Welcome to quadratic probing. So quadratic probing is the exact same idea as linear probing. It is also a type of open addressing, but instead of looking right next door, we're gonna try and space out the next possible location that we're looking for. So we don't get all the collisions kind of like bumping up against each other. Let's look at it in an animation. So here we've already inserted 89. It went into its natural hash. We've already inserted 18. It went into its natural hash. We've already inserted 49, even though it's under my animation um, and so far. And so now it's time to insert things. Here we go. Thank you, 49. Thank you, 49. Um, and so this is how we would calculate where 49 is going to go. 49 originally wanted to go here into space nine. So you can see 49 mod 10, that's our natural hash, right? Plus this is the first sort of iteration. So this is natural hash. But we noticed nine is full. So then we did 49 mod 10 plus one times one, that gives us zero. So technically the first space that we look for in quadratic probing is our next door neighbor. So we look next door one time, and then we happen to have, that was free, so we put 49 there. Now let's see if my animation shows up. 58, so 58 we theoretically want to put here. As you can see, 58's natural hash is eight, but that's full. And so we've already placed 89, and so we did that math, but gosh darn, if that isn't full, so we need to do it again, so 89 minus two, and then you can see here, that's our sort of growth through the quadratic function there. So 89's natural hash would have been, or 58, sorry. 58's natural hash would have been eight, but we add in four. So that gives us a location of two in this table. And now finally, 79, we can see there, it's natural hash is nine, that's busy. So natural, the next natural hash is zero, but that's busy. So the next natural hash is then three yeah but let's see then uh, we could hit this problem however where 
eventually we might hit a situation where since we're not trying every single empty spot, we're kind of making these jumps, our math might cause us to sort of loop back around and loop back around. And instead we might hit this infinite loop problem. So with quadratic probing, we've started to introduce this idea of instead of like just looking next door, we're going to spread things out a little bit, which hopefully will, you know, stretch out those clusters. We're going to try and reduce the amount of clusters because we're baking in space. But we could hit this problem where we go, don't find an empty slot. So you'll see this little piece here. Really, you need to resize when lambda is greater than or equal to one half. So with linear probing, we're like, it's a good idea to resize at the one half. For quadratic probing, you have to resize at the one half. Otherwise, you could accidentally hit an infinite loop. And obviously, an infinite loop is sort of like the literal opposite of good runtime, because that's just spending instructions to do literally nothing. Right? That's going to cause a crash. Questions about how quadratic probing sort of functions in this way. Cool. Um, what, yeah, why? Why does it cause this infinite loop? There were still empty spots. What gives? We're just not guaranteed to check every possible spot. That's because of how we do the math. So here's some examples of it. You can sort of look at here. Um, so here we've got four items that all had um, tried to hash to the same location. Um, so I put 19 in first. It went to its natural hash. Then 39 tried that natural hash. That wasn't good, so it went here. Then 29 came in, and this was full, and this was full, so it ended up in three. And then eight came, or nine came in, and it was not here, not here, not here, not here. So for example, if I tried to add in 49 now, would 49 be able to find any spot in this hash table? No. So 49 cause infinite loop. This also uh, technically counts as what we would call a secondary clustering, just to give you another terminology for this. And this is because we are starting to kind of hit these like buckets that we're going to double check a bunch of times. Um, so you can technically kind of end up with these like same buckets that we're looking at. We're looking at this one and this one and this one and this one. We just like didn't even look at any of these buckets. So technically we would call this secondary clustering and too much secondary clustering is what causes that infinite loop in the quadratic probing situation. Yeah. So the question was, if you're looping too many times, can we just add some code in to change over to linear probing? And so in that case, that might help us find an open spot. But think about how complicated the code's going to be and how many iterations we might have to make if we're going to try and retrieve that thing out. Because any way that we find to programmatically insert stuff into the hash table, that's what we have to unroll to find something to get it back out. So you'll find that we typically don't co-mingle collision resolutions that way but welcome to uh we're gonna let's see yeah so that's the end of those welcome to double hashing this is a way to co-mingle some collision resolution strategies and this is our last real uh hashing uh collision resolution we're going to talk about and it, it will kind of serve what you mentioned here so Probing causes us to check the same indices over and over. That's a bummer, right? We were just asking, like, why do we keep looping? Um, can we check different ones instead? So what we could do is we can literally add in a secondary hash function, one that we only really use if, like, we've run out of the natural hashes. So how does this work? Here what we've got is the natural hash and then we've got our secondary hash function, and that gets us to what we call hash prime, where it's going to end up. So here is some pseudocode for how this might look. So we originally get our natural hash, just like we've been doing all along. So what this does is this goes, and it gets that deterministic hash number. 
We then mod by the current table size. We check while that's in use. What we do is we then pull in a secondary function to generate a little bit more deterministic info about that item so that we can find a new location for it. So for example, this is usually coming into account when we have a lot more complex hash keys. It's really hard to do this as you can imagine with int values, but like let's say we had a student object and that student object was our key, right? So we're gonna say keys equals students. And let's say a student object has inside of it, maybe it's got like a first name and it's got a last name you know, something like that. And maybe what we do is our first hash code is just based on your last name. We're like, hey, like last names are pretty unique, but we know that there's some collisions on hash names, right? So maybe like our first one is like length, you know, or maybe we even do like that, like sort of sum of cares on your last name to generate that first level hash function. So that would be our natural hash. Then we mod that by table size. And then if that's full, then this method here, jump, maybe what it does is it like adds in the sum of characters of your first name. So it goes in and it does a little bit more computational work based on what's unique about that object. And it only bothers to do that if there's a collision then. So we can kind of come up with this, well, what's a like initial hash function that's really cheap? Maybe it causes a few more collisions than we would like. But then we only start to incur the more expensive computational stuff in the event of a collision. So maybe for some of us, they only needed our last name. For others of us, maybe they need to incorporate information from our first name to find a unique spot. Do I have? Let's see what I've got. Oh, okay. Um, yes, that's not super interesting. Um, so in this open addressing situation, how do we resize? Um, same as separate chaining. Uh, we have to remake the table. We have to reevaluate the hash function over again. Um, so what we would do is when we resize, we would go through and get that first level hash function on everything and then only generate the second hash function if it collides in the new table. So we don't always come back around and use that secondary hash function. Um, when to resize, uh, yes, these are sort of hard maxims. Um, so obviously with linear probing, we have to get bigger than one. Uh, with quadratic, we have to do um, greater than one half, otherwise we might fail uh, for our linear loop. And then of course, uh, with the lambda of one, we wanna make sure that we're rehashing at uh, one so that we have space in it. But you can start to sort of combine these things if you wanted. So double hashing is one way to get to um, maybe the next level, but you could start to chain these things together. Yeah, question. Uh, that means, um, in this case, that means a number that doesn't have a ton of common divisors. I don't really like that term. I'm not going to quiz you on it. I'm just going to put this slide up. There's a bunch of uh, summaries at the end. There is That was only scratching the surface of different designs in the hashing world. Here is a bunch of other things. I will tell you, nobody's asked me about any of these sort of by name in an interview. So everything we went over so far in our three days of hashing should cover you. Um, but like I said, hashing is probably one of the most useful things you're gonna get from this class. And so if you wanna continue your hashing education, here's a bunch of other options. You can read it, it's on the course webpage. Okay, thanks so much everybody. Come back Wednesday. We're gonna start a brand new topic on Wednesday. Yay, get ready for tree season. Huzzah, yeah, it's happening.